All right, thank you. Our, uh, I didn't, I, I felt it was okay to steal just a couple moments from our next speaker's time because our next speaker is me. And uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Craig Stowe. And for those who do know me, I'm Craig Stowe. Um, but I'm gonna speak for a few minutes now about some long-term temperature monitoring that Noah Glurl has conducted in Southern Lake Michigan for just over 30 years at this point. And, and uh, let's see, this program, or at least the initial deployment of this thermistor string was, well, I guess almost 34 years ago at this point. Uh, what's shown here is Mike McCormick, who's been retired for, from Gloral for some time now, uh, deploying this thermistor string on June 8th in 1990. Is this thing advancing on its own? Okay, we'll see what happens. Uh, on June 8th in 1990, uh, there's a schematic of what that thermistor string looks like in the middle here. And you can see it's a, a number of different sensors at different depths. There's a float in the middle and it's anchored at the bottom. On the upper right, there is a, uh, um, map of the Great Lakes, you see the thermistor string that I'm um, speaking to right now in Southern Lake Michigan. There are a couple of other black dots, one in Lake Superior and one in Northern Lake Huron. Those have been deployed now for somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 years. And this year we're going to deploy two new moorings, one both depicted in red, one in Northern Lake Michigan and one in Southern Lake Huron. Uh, so we'll have a, 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 a uh, the beginnings of a network for long-term temperature monitoring. And this is one of the most fundamental things we can measure. Temperature, we, we know how to measure temperature well. We've done it for a long time. These aren't terribly expensive uh, sensors that require a whole lot of maintenance. They're switched out every year and a half or so. And I guess I'd make the point that, that it would be really beneficial to the Great Lakes community to, to systematically develop a network of this sort of monitoring for, it's a, Long-term monitoring is always hard to justify in the moment. It's an investment, but we learn an awful lot from these kinds of deployments. And I'll argue that there, there's almost nothing more valuable than long-term data in this business. Uh, and I'll, in, in the, the, the uh, bottom right-hand corner, we published the results that I'm gonna speak to in Nature Communications a couple years ago. Uh, and the lead author was Eric Anderson. Eric is really responsible for pulling these data together and. and and assembling a team and, and doing most of the analysis. So I wanna give some proper attribution to, to Eric's uh, contribution in this part. When we pull these uh, data out, well, this is now just a depiction of the deployments over time. You can see the, the vertical axis is the depth and, and time is on the X axis. And you can see the actual location of the sensors changed a little bit over time. There are some gaps periodically uh, where, where something happened where the deployments were not active. On the bottom, you can see that the instrumentation changed over time. The uh, available sensors uh, were differed a little bit uh, over this 30 year period. And early on, they, uh, the they temperature was logged every three hours. It's currently logged every hour. And actually for the last couple of years, it's been logged every couple of minutes. And it, it, it seems real nice to have such high resolution data, but it's actually an immense amount of data to work with and to, to do anything with it takes a, a tremendous amount of computer time. So we've increased our resolution both temporally and, and throughout the water column, generally speaking, over the period of record. And this is a depiction now using some interpolation methods of what the temperature has looked like over this period of time you can see near the surface that it heat, the, the red indicates that it heats up during the summer, it goes to greater depths. And, and as you might expect, then it mixes to the, to the top to bottom at some point, and the cycle's repeated. The, these long-term measurements give us a good indication of, of, how, of when stratification begins, when it peaks, and, and when it ends. Now I find this to be one of the more interesting figures in the presentation. 
what we've done here is we've complemented these sensor data with satellite-derived surface temperature data. That's the, uh, the top panel. And uh, I spent a lot of time looking at this figure. There's a whole lot of information here, and I'm really easily entertained. So I, I guess that I spent my whole career, I think, trying to interpret squiggly lines. But what I find fascinating is the, the surface temperature data, while well, it goes up and down annually, as, as you might expect. And as you move down with depth, look at how that signal becomes distorted. It's a, a very sinusoidal looking, and it becomes very sharp and jagged as you move down through the water column to the bottom panel. I'm going to focus in a little bit now. What I'm looking at here is just the, a, a, a short window of from 2009 of the surface data as well as the data from the 110 meter depth. And when you show this picture to folks, the immediate reaction is, well, that looks like a heartbeat. It's kind of like an EKG readout. It looks a little better than the one I had done just a couple months ago, actually. So we think we've discovered the heartbeat of Lake Michigan in, in this analysis. Um, but on the right side, what, what's really interesting is you can tell essentially to the hour when overturn occurs, when the minimum temperature occurs, and when stratification begins to occur. That's the uh, O and the M and the S. So we have a really good record of, of how this temperature was, was propagated from the surface to the bottom and when specific events occurred. Now we've examined these data a lot of different ways. We've used linear regression techniques. We've used a, a, a more non-parametric technique, still linear, a sense slope estimator, a seasonal trend decomposition using OS, which is a non-linear technique. And actually what's depicted here is kind of a hybrid using elements of all three of those, those techniques. The figure on the left is, is quite busy. I'm not sure how well you can see it from where you're sitting. But what we've done is we've broken out a number of depths from the top to the bottom for each month of the year, moving across from, from left to right, and looked at that signal that results from the seasonal trend decomposition technique, and then run a couple different lines through it to get an estimate of whether we see warming or cooling um, uh, trends over that period of time. And that information then is summarized in the figure in the lower right. And again, moving from left to right, we, it goes through the year, top to bottom goes uh, with depth through the water column. Red is an indicator of a warming trend. Blue is an indicator of, of cooling. And if there's a dot in it, it means there was a particularly strong signal to noise ratio. And I think what, what's evident here, if you look at this for a while, is the predominant signal you see in this overall uh, pattern is a, a, a red or warming trend What's kind of interesting, if you look in the general, uh, if you go down to the second depth and look in the August to September range, it actually looks like it's cooling. And that's because that sensor was below the thermocline and these stratifications occurring later. So at a time when that depth used to feel warming by mixing of the water column, it's not feeling that warming anymore. And it shows up as a cooling trend. And you can see that sort of propagating down through the depths a little bit later in the, in the year. We've done some estimates of the, the warming rate of the surface as, as well as at depth. And what we find is, is there, there's an, a, a pretty discernible warming trend. It's a lot higher near the surface than it is at depth. The table that you probably can't read very well is just a comparison of different methods that we applied to estimate the warming trend uh, throughout the water column. And, and the, the consistent trend is that we see general warming um, over in the, in the range of a couple tenths of a degree 
Celsius per decade. And that's comparable to the values that are shown for the ocean, the air, and lakes more generally uh, from a publication that uh, from state of the climate, and something I can't read on this screen. But. So it's reasonably consistent warming comparable to what we're seeing in other systems. So to summarize, we think this is the longest continuous high frequency lake temperature data from anywhere in the world. Uh, the high temporal resolution lets us really pinpoint specific events. We can see to the hour when at 60 meters stratification reached that depth. The deep waters are warming, but not nearly as fast as the surface water. We can see hints of warming almost to the bottom, uh, and that's at about 140 meters at this particular site. There's a, I didn't emphasize this in the presentation, but there's a, a stop. There's a, a several week lag between when destratification occurs and when you see that signal of warm water reach the bottom. I had kind of a textbook, I don't know, concept in my mind that destratification occurs and there's instantaneous mixing from surface to bottom. It's weeks before the, the warm water, before the surface to bottom mixing really occurs. Well, it's, you know, it's a, a deep lake. I guess that's not too surprising, but it changed the way I think about this, these events. Uh, there, we are looking at possibly the, the idea that the lake is shifting from a dimictic to a monomictic state. It, it, we have some at least preliminary thoughts that we're not really reverse stratifying in the winter. And this is work that's currently underway. It's unclear actually if Lake Michigan is, is currently dimictic. It may be essentially in a warm monomictic state at this point. Um, the implications for everything else that occurs in the lake, water quality, productivity, biodiversity, all of those important things are something to be explored into the future. And I think I have time for questions if there are any. No, this is for the location at that mooring. It's it's not a lake-wide average. Oh, uh, can I go back that easy? It is the dot you see in, in, in the southern end of Lake Michigan there. Thomas? Um, um, no, <laughs> yeah, I, it just, the mixing isn't instantaneous. It, it's the, the surface to bottom. I'm probably not going to give the level of explanation you're, you're, you're looking for here, but it's just that it, it, to penetrate that deeply, it, it mixes little by little and just, I don't think, I don't know, I'm going to look at Eric and see, did we ask that specific question? Whether the, the rate of mixing, surface to bottom mixing differed among years. You know, the, the below the, the thermocline, the water temperature is doesn't differ that much, and unless there's, I'll, I'll say, wind-induced turbulence, it, there's there's 
it's not like there are major density differences that, that would cause that to mix very deeply. That's about as sophisticated as an explanation as I'm going to come up with off the top of my head. I'm, I'm having a little trouble. It's, it's echoing. Maybe you should use the mic for the virtual people. Great talk, Craig. Um, you talked about the importance of long-term monitoring um, stations. Um, um, if you could have your wish of a number of permanent stations throughout the basin to measure temperature and perhaps other parameters, what what's the scale? Is how many how many stations per lake on average? Recognizing you know this is a whole session perhaps in a question, but appreciate your reaction. Yeah, I'm I'm going to suggest that be the really good basis for a, a workshop to to determine uh, you know i can give an answer off the top of my head we want to hit the deep areas some shallow areas uh near some tributaries that sort of thing to catch a, a, a range of conditions i you know what more is better uh to a point but i i again i think that would be a, a great basis to convene a group to say what what kind of network would we need to effectively answer a given set of questions that I haven't articulated yet? 